Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, we discuss medical topics and lifestyle. In today's video, we are talking about colon cancer. More specifically, today's conversation is going to be about the risk factors regarding colorectal or colon cancer. Now, there are risk factors that we can't really change, such as genetic things, but there are other risk factors we certainly can change, such as lifestyle. So let's get started with the video. This won't be a video on signs and symptoms and things like that, but rather just the protective and risk factors surrounding colorectal cancer, or CRC. So let's quickly just define what colon cancer is and a little bit of anatomy. So here we have the large intestine and the rectum, and this is a cancer, colorectal cancer, which involves the large intestine and or the rectum. And the whole reason it's important to talk about this topic is because it's so common. It's the third most common cancer in the USA, the third most deadly cancer in the USA. Um, in other countries, such as the UK, it, the statistics are similar as well. In regards to the anatomy of the colon or the large intestine, so food enters our mouth, goes through the esophagus into the stomach, where the whole process gets started of digesting food. It passes on into the small intestine, and from there, then, it goes, it goes into the large intestine. So it starts off in the cecum, and then it uh, goes up to the ascending colon, through the transverse colon, descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and then finally the rectum and the anus, where it passes out. Now, things to mention about the large intestine and its actual function. So partly digested food moves through the cecum into the, into the rest of the colon, where water and nutrients um, and electrolytes are absorbed. The other important thing to note here about the large intestine is that it's home to the um, to the gut microbiome or the, all the bacteria that live inside the um, the intestine. So there's so much to talk about here, which we'll save for another video. But they play an important role in regulation of uh, of our bodies as a whole. So, like I said, um, it's the third most common cancer overall. Uh, there is a lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer. It's about 1 in 15 for women and 1 in, 15, 1 in 19 for men, sorry. Um, and it accounts for, in the UK at least, for about 14% of all cancers. And um, in the UK, again, it accounts for about 16,000 deaths per year. So this is uh, roughly similar, you know, at least across the, the, the Western world. Um, Two-thirds of colorectal cancer arise in the colon and... Um, arise in the colon and the remaining third arises in the rectum, right? So in the last part of the colon. About 72% of tumors occur in patients above the age of 65, right? So it's the average age of onset is in the 60s and the 70s, um, but it's more and more common in the younger population and all the more reason to talk about it. I mean, it's been, it's been um, mentioned in the news a few times, you know, there's been famous people getting diagnosed with it at a young age and so on. So it's a really important topic to talk about. And now let's move on to the risk factor. So we mentioned the risk factors that we can influence and risk factors that we can't really influence. So the first one that comes to mind here is age. So the longer an individual lives, the more chances the cells in our body have the ability to mutate, to become damaged, um, unable to be repaired, thus increasing the risk of getting cancer in general, not just CRC, colorectal cancer. We have certain mechanisms in our bodies that regulate and correct mistakes, but as we age, um, we become less efficient and mistakes can happen along the way, leading to mutations and uh, eventually things like cancer developing. So this is something that we can't change, unfortunately. Now, when it comes to the genetic side of things, there, there, it's important to note that although cancer can arise for those reasons, for genetic reasons, most cancers are sporadic. So there's no known genetic cause per se, but rather they're attributed to multiple factors that are well known. So it's not a sole reason hereditarily, but several reason, uh, several known risk factors that increase risk, which we'll, we'll cover in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the video as we go along. But uh, in general, so here are some genes that are kind of serving to regulate these things in our bodies. I don't expect you to memorize these, but you know, there's the APC gene, there's the KRAS, um, and there's the P53. So these are all things that regulate, uh, regulate our cells and uh, our ability to repair. So it's a combination of things, really. So it's our genetics as well as our environment. And these then paint this picture in our bodies and, and the risk factors that can have a role here.
Let's get into family history. So this plays a role certainly in the development of colorectal cancer. Family history indicates a genetic mechanism that predisposes you to get colorectal cancer. So you have a genetic factor or mutation that increases your chance of getting cancer in general, or even specifically in this case, colorectal cancer. This is more pronounced when you've had relatives that are first degree. In addition to that, uh, they're young, younger than the age of 16 in particular. Um, this increases the risk. So if you have a parent or a grandparent who's had colorectal cancer diagnosed when, you know, in their 80s, then this may not mean much for your chances of getting it. But if there are features like getting cancer at a very young age, for example, it could indicate that there is a genetic condition going on here that could predispose you to getting it. So uh, down here, we have a pathway of how this happens, right? So you have a normal colon, a colon at risk, um, and then this goes on to this goes on to uh, getting an adenoma and then a carcinoma. And above that, we can see the security systems that are breached in terms of those genetics. So the APC, for example, um, that get damaged or unable to do their job properly. And then it takes us on to the next step. And that's just one of the molecular pathways of how we develop colorectal carcinoma. Here we have a genetic disorder that predisposes us to getting CRC, so familial adenomatous polyposis. So it's an autosomal dominant condition, meaning that you only need one allele from a parent to get passed down, and then you will get it. So only one parent needs to have it, essentially. It's due to a gene mutation, or specifically a mutation on the APC gene on the fifth chromosome, and um, essentially it involves polyps forming in your colon, and ultimately um, you, it always progresses, right, to getting CRC, and it can happen as early as, you know, in your 30s and 40s, um, and it always involves the rectum as well. So this is one of the conditions that can predispose us to getting CRC, colorectal carcinoma. Now, this one's the most known, but there are other conditions involved as well that can predispose us. So namely, there's uh, something called Lynch syndrome, which again is an autosomal dominant condition. Um, Lynch syndrome is also called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal ca cancer. It has an 80% chance of progressing, and it always involves the beginning, so the proximal colon. There are other conditions like Gardner syndrome and Turcotte syndrome. We'll make videos on these. Other hereditary con conditions that we have are inflammatory bowel disease, so primarily ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So these are uh, chronic inflammatory disorders, autoimmune disorders, where the body mistakes itself, the intestine, as, as some sort of an enemy. So here we have ulcerative colitis that has the higher risk of getting CRC, and it's because of a chronic inflammatory process in the large intestine. So we have ulcers that are there, and there's a constant turnover of of um, repair damage, repair damage. So imagine a cut that you keep picking at, for example. This is what's going on here, similar to that kind of a process. And um, that then predisposes you again. So these types of patients need regular colonoscopies every every five years or so to monitor the situation and, and try to keep things under control and uh, catch anything early on. Now, I just want to stress before we move on to the modifiable risk factors that despite having some sort of genetic predispositions to developing cancer or CRC in, in particular, the modifiable risk factors should always be addressed because they will always minimize the, the risks of getting CRC uh, despite having genetic components. So yes, you may be dealt a bit of a, a bit of a bad bad card in that sense, but you can always focus on the modifiable risk factors and try to control what's in your power. So first one we have is smoking on the list. So smoking exposes us to many bad things, exposes us to carcinogens. It essentially puts our bodies in a state where increased number and increased frequency of gene mutations can happen. This puts us at risk uh, of getting many cancers, not just CRC. Um, basically, you know, we have good soup with good ingredients and smoking adds so many terrible ingredients to it. That's the analogy you can look at. So if you, if you do smoke, please stop smoking. Um, it will only help. Alcohol, again, increases the risk of, of a number of cancers yet again. So reducing or stopping is, is important here. And the big one is dietary factors, right? So this is a contributing factor. Low fiber diet is a big one here. So low fiber diet um, can be researched all over the internet. Um, and um, 
has a relationship to our gut microbiome. That's the key here. Basically, increasing fiber is key in preventing cancer, keeping a good balance in our gut. Fiber can be found in loads of places like grains and vegetables, so there really isn't a reason why we don't have enough of it. But unfortunately, um, you know, we've adopted this sad diet or standard American diet, as they like to call it, which is prominent all over the world now. And uh, yeah, it's just high processed, high processed food, low fiber. Um, that's a, that's a bad thing. And, you know, high processed meat intake is also quite bad, increases the risk. So it was all over the news a few years ago, continues to be. And the thought here is that it introduces carcinogens to our body, disrupts our gut. It's just a bad ingredient in that soup I was mentioning. So high red meat intake. Um, also, it's why the Mediterranean diet, for example, is so recommended as a healthy diet because uh, there isn't such a prominence on red meat intake and processed food in general. Thought here again is the carcinogens, the reactive oxygen species at play here. So I'd rather stick to a diet of vegetables, fiber, fish, occasional meat, nuts, and grains. So this is what we should be aiming for. And then finally, it's uh, obesity. Obesity is a key factor here, sedentary lifestyle. So tying into the whole theme of healthy lifestyle, adding good food and, and uh, or, or bad ingredients to your soup. So obesity is definitely a factor here. Um, increase the risk by about 30% of getting cancers being overweight by 15%. Physical activity can decrease the risk by 30%. So it's important to note that, you know, these these aren't really my opinions. These, you know, you can scour the internet, find similar conclusions and evidence-based models and studies for all these things that we've mentioned in this video. So in conclusion, I mean, uh, yes, there are genetics at play here, but our environment shapes us as well, right? So we have to concentrate our efforts uh, just a bit focus on the healthy lifestyle it can make a huge contribution so stick to healthy ingredients not bad ones we can minimize our chances of getting cancer and uh, overall uh, overall you know it's affecting younger younger age groups now so we really need to be mindful of these modifiable lifestyle factors not only will your body thank you but so will your mind so that's it for our video today please like and subscribe for more leave a comment in the section below for other things you want us to cover and we'll see you in the next one